Okay, welcome everybody. This is the first of a series of the second res uh, speaker series that we're going to be doing uh, roughly once a month. And this first one is on the Beyond Zero Trust Program, which has been going on for, for more than two and a half years. And it's been transformational in improving VMware's security posture. Two of the architects key to this endeavor are Brad Doctor and Craig Savage. Brad is an accomplished technology professional with over 24, uh, 25 years of experience in the industry and more than 20 patents to his name. He has a, a proven track record of developing innovative solutions and driving successful projects at a variety of companies, including VMware, Lumen Technologies, and various startups. Craig Savage brings over two decades of experience to working with VMware business units and external customers in the transformation of their information security practice. Craig and his team focus on extracting lessons learned and turning them into strategic goals that drive our pragmatic cybersecurity program. Prior to VMware, he was an enterprise architect and security consultant at Accenture and Capgemini and presents regularly on diverse information security topics. So over to you, Craig and Brad. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate it. Nice intro. <laughs> it's always slightly humbling. Let's dive in. So this this is where we started Beyond Your Trust. So these those of you that remember uh, back when I was still not as gray, <laughs> we had a major incident in our uh, industry. Uh, those of you that remember, remember the company called SolarWinds. Um, they had a major breach, kind of changed a lot of things and we as VMware already had a bunch of initiatives. I think it's fair to say, Brad, we had a lot of stuff going um, and that enabled us to kind of centralize the management of those initiatives and accelerate a bunch of the work that we were trying to get done. And we called that Beyond Zero Trust. Uh, so that's where it came from. And this, this is really back from 2020 um, where we came up with this kind of stuff. And you notice even then we were talking about trust Zero Trust was starting to become a thing in the industry. We were starting to talk about Zero Trust and uh, and we were even then talking about, right, we, you know, we have to be able to generate trust from our supply chain and from our customers, people we supply to. So that's where we came from. You know, a, Brad, a point yeah. Ever. yeah, no, you know, I think what 2018 or something like that, you know, we started working on ZTI, Zero Trust Initiative. You know, Alex and, and I were talking a lot about that and, and, you know, what can we do to make things better? It was like a track initially of, I think, five different things, and they're all kind of best effort. And, and we made some progress, right, for sure. But, you know, when we got to the whole solar winds thing, it's like, okay, so we've been doing this stuff, and now we got to do, you know, a heck of a lot more than that. You know, we started talking like, well, we need to go beyond where we are. And so that's, that's why we ended up calling it Beyond Zero Trust, because we already had ZTI, Zero Trust Initiative, in place already. And so, you know, when solar winds hit, um, that was kind of the, the catalyst to say, okay, we've got to, you know, pedal to the metal, so to speak. And, um, you know, between Alex and the board and, and, and all of us working with our stakeholders to codify what needed to be done and what would it take, you know, became, like you said, a transformation program. And, and you know, one of the biggest mobilizations of um, resources to holistically address, you know, an issue, many issues, of course, um, that I've ever seen in my career. And, uh, you know, it's kudos to the VMware way of doing things to come together and say, this is what we need to do. If we get the resources, we'll do it. Cool. Three months later, here are the resources. Boom. Now we're doing it. So really, really, really cool uh, to see that come to life. I like I start my video now. I'll start it. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 I'm good now, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, it was pretty incredible to see all that stuff come together. And uh, I'd say even more incredible to look back on it now to see what we accomplished. And, uh, you know, Kudos to every single person who who helped us because you know the role of infosec. You know when you look at the tracks and the, the actual work and pretty close work, actual hands on, it was less for infosec. You know from from the hands on, more from the project management sort of the vision. You know what needed to be done. Those are stakeholders that made it possible, made it real. And uh, you know you look at the complexities they had to go through, the pain they had to go through. Um, our load pales in comparison to our stakeholders, and so I want to acknowledge that up front. Our stakeholders are what made this program uh, successful and continue to do so as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think just on that note, you know, what we're going to do here today, um, I realize I haven't made an agenda slide. So my apologies for those of you that need agenda slides. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the program was and what we did and are doing. Then what we're going to talk about is really how we've taken this 
program that we've done, the stuff that we've done, and we've transformed it into stuff that is consumable by our peers in the industry, by our customers, because the reality is doing something once is nice, but making it repeatable is where it's at for, for a security professional. You know, what we really want is we want other people to be able to emulate our success. So you'll see some of the slides uh, that myself and Brad and others frequently speak to with customers to try and articulate not only the fact that this is possible, but it really isn't that difficult either. Um, so that's how we're gonna play today's fireside chat for you. Brad and I are gonna talk through as we go through this stuff like you've just seen. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the program, Brad. I think uh, this is a very busy slide. Don't worry, we're not gonna read it to you. Um, you know, we started this program with 20 projects. As Brad said, you know, we kind of had five that were already in progress. I think it might've been more than five, but around five. And I remember that spreadsheet that you created, Brad, back in December of 2019, I think it was. Um, and you put a bunch of ideas of, yeah, we should probably do this as well. <laughs> and that transformed into, into this. Yeah, you know, the, those ideas were um, um, just that. And it was our stakeholders who came in and helped codify what that would translate into as an outcome. And uh, you know, with our, our assistance, of course, right? But, but there again, you know, the VMware way of coming together and, and solving problems like that um, is fantastic. And so, you know, some of the, the biggest programs we did were you know, managed devices, um, re-architecting Wi-Fi, you know, in terms of like impact, right? Um, some of the hardest things to manage as well. You know, when you think about what we could have done better, you know, with, um, you know, as a program, you know, I think comms was much larger and more important than I ever realized. And so from a career growth perspective, if there's one thing that really will stick with me, it was uh, getting comms right at scale. And uh, whenever you're going to change the way someone does their work, you have to understand it's a very personal thing for that person. And uh, put yourself in their shoes. Like, what do you need to know? Like, what would it look like to me? What would it look like to you? In terms of columns and such. And so, so it, was, it was sticky, to say the least. But, you know, the outcomes uh, were well worth it. And, gosh, what was it December 22? Uh, we did the managed device rollout. And so here we are, let's call it almost nine months in. And um, they're great like a few issues here and there, of course, but overall it's been a fantastic uh, outcome. So, so yeah. 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 We've made some phenomenal changes. I mean, you just have to look at, you know, the, uh, you know, we originally budgeted this at a little over 25 million. Um, you know, that that's a staggering amount of money for VMware. They, and the business were prepared to put that on the table. That's what is really key. You know? Oh, they did put it on the table. We just didn't need to spend it all. Yeah. You know? So they did put the money on the table. Yes. Which is also an issue as well. So when you, you know thinking through this program and at this scale for all the leaders, anyone who aspires to be a leader, you know financial responsibility um, goes a whole really a long way. So when you say you need X amount of money, they expect you to spend that amount of money because you said you needed it. So we actually had to defend why we're underspending in the program, believe it or not. Um, so it was delayed hiring. You can see hearing okay that came on you know, later. We couldn't have predicted that. But other than this, we're just, well, we found a better way to do it. Like at first we thought it would cost this, and then we talked, and then we found a better way to do it, and it cost that instead. Cool, this, these are net positive things, right? But the, the point is when you've given that amount of money, which is more than most startups will get, to be clear. 25 million is more than most startups will ever see as a funding round. So it's huge, right, is, is my point. But when you ask for and you get that, they expect you to have a very clear way that you're gonna go through and use it. And they expect you to use all of it, right? Because the thing is, from a business perspective, if we get the money, someone else does not. If we then give it back, yeah, it's good for the business. Okay, fine. But that group still didn't get their money. Now they're in a bad way, right? Whoever they may be. So always keep that in mind that when you ask for your resources, make sure you're able to use them fully. Um, so yeah, financial responsibility is, is, is goes both ways, right? Not overspending, but not underspending either. It's kind of right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, I remember some of those conversations. And I mean, the other thing to notice as well, um, you know, like I said, we started with those 20 projects, but we've actually landed on 42 in total. Um, so if you think about that, you know, that's 22 extra projects were added as we were running through on the program. And I think, Brad, that's probably a testament to, to both the power of the BZT brand as such. That, you know, we almost created a brand and brand recognition in the business such yeah. that, you know, if, if we needed to drive change, making it a Beyond Zero Trust program actually gave it a significant boost in adoption and tolerance from our business. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, you know, um, uh, what does good look like for a program like this? You know, we're ultimately managing risk. And so the framework we set out from the very beginning was whatever the risk, current risk is, 
that's what it is. We need to move it to wherever it needs to be. So for instance, critical to maybe a moderate risk, or even high to a moderate risk, right? Or, or, or to low, obviously the ultimate. It's no such thing as no risk, uh, but that's how we were measured for success. One of the most important things. Occasionally we had slips, right? But those actually weren't that common, which is really cool. Um, but did we move the needle from where we said we were to where we said we were going to? And uh, that's the ultimate outcome. But then we needed to prove that. So we've had multiple external audits, internal as well, um, to say, hey, we think we did, but did we actually? The answer more often than not is yes, in fact, we did. Uh, so again, from an InfoSec program perspective, that's the metric that really matters is the risk reduction. So at the end of the day, that's why we're here. So the business needs us is to help reduce and manage risk. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you you brought out two really good points here, Brad. One is, you know, um, yeah, we talk about trust, the on-zero trust, but there was a very heavy element of verify in there, right? Which is, again, the cornerstone of the whole zero trust mindset, if you like. Um, and I think the other thing that we learned as a company as we went through this is, uh, to your point about slippage, actually quite a few of the projects slipped. If you look there, 45% of them slipped. However, what we learned as a business was if you're tracking that risk score and it's actually gone down already, then the slippage isn't that important, right? You can tolerate going from 90 to 100% in a longer period of time as long as you've got to 90 in a good amount of time. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, a lot of the programs, um, projects, your tracks, if you will, um, weren't you know, wait until the end and then we're where we need to be. They're mitigating throughout the life cycle of that program. You know, some were, of course, you know, what I call a light switch project that had to be done for whatever, but, you know, for the most part, they weren't. And so, again, they're, they're again, from a leader perspective, you know, managing the risk, you know, iteratively, um, you know, as I've told my teams many times over the, the past, you know, nine plus years, you know, we're causing so much change that it's hard to see on a daily basis, right? It still feels like nothing's really changed. But look 12 months back, right? Reflect 12 months ago versus now. And like, wow, yeah, that's, wow, like a lot of changes, right? So there again, for like BZ, reflect back 12 months or even 24 months where we are now, how things were then. So, you know, when you're driving transformation um, at any program, you know, InfoSec especially, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to see the progress in the moment in that day, you know? Uh, but you have to look at the metrics, you have to look at the projects, you have to look at the outcomes, basically, to, to understand, are we going in the right direction? So that's the other thing, is that much money, constant, constant attention are we going in the right direction is this achieving the outcome we said it would achieve is there a better way to do it great example identity-based networking you know our technical marketing team in nsx um, are absolutely incredible um not quite realistic in terms of what's possible but you know i made a call at one point for one of our projects so look we've gone as far as we can we found better ways to do what we wanted to accomplish to begin with let's stop going down this identity-based you know uh, track and instead go down this track, right? Which is a better way to do things based on what we know now. You know, a perfect example of, you know, we knew what we knew when we asked for the money in the programs, but we weren't fully sure or deployed, right? But that's a risk to any program, of course, right? You always have to strive and shoot for the moon, you know, that sort of thing. So, but you also have to be agile, right? You know, if you, you know, as a project leader, if you recognize you're going down the wrong track, you have to be able to call that out and say, look, we need to reevaluate this. You know, and that takes guts because there's a lot of momentum, a lot of people, a lot of money involved, um, but it's almost always the right thing to do to at least be critical of the decisions and the path that we're going on. It's still the right path, it's still the right decision, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. I think just before we move on, I wanted to talk about the actual delivery, if you like, of this, the implementation and how crucial those relationships were that you mentioned earlier. You know, a, a shout out to two teams amongst many is, is obviously our CT team, the college experience team. They were extremely helpful in a lot of the colleague facing pieces of work that we had to do here. And, and the you know, the whole CDTO team really for their willingness to take on some of the challenges that we posed and and work through that pushback from the business. Um, you know, and I I'm interested because I know you had a number of meetings with sort of principal engineers and stuff. What stood out to you as as where the, the turning point was from? No, we don't want to change to, well, actually, yes, maybe we should do the right thing. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it really came when we started just executing and saying, well, you know, this is how it's going to be. Like, there's, we're not going to turn this back. You know, we're going to consider and incorporate feedback everywhere we can, you know, be the business partner. But sometimes you can't. For instance, we can't make exceptions on every application we use, whether they should require a managed device or not. 
you know, we can do that for critical applications that require step-up authentication, but there's just simply too many other applications to for us to stack and there's a deal with. So the uniform application of a managed device created a lot of issues for a lot of people, myself included, right? You know, we're on the same boat, but it was the right thing to do. And at the end of the day, you know, these are VMware delivered, VMware funded applications, you know, we're consuming, or whatever they may be. And so it's perfectly fine to require a managed device to access them, even if the risk seems like it's lower, because managing that level of complexity is greater than the risk itself. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, again, it's, you know, risk management one-on-one, like, you know, you're never going to make everyone happy. It's, you know, governance as well. You're never going to make everyone happy at the same time, um, but you have to make the decisions and stick with them and move forward until you have new data. If you have new data and, and, and new capabilities, then you can reevaluate those decisions, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So if you're happy, Brad, I think we'll step into talking about how we articulate the changes we roll uh, to the wider world. So. Okay. This is a, a diagram helpfully drawn for us by John Sylvia some while back. Um, and we use this a lot when we're explaining to people how at a, <laughs> an incredibly high and simplistic level, we've structured our very complicated environment. Any thoughts on how you particularly call out the changes when you talk to this? Yeah, no, when I talk to customers, you know, um... It's, it's, it's these three things right here, right? In, in order, domain less, password less, and network less. So you know, the universe is how we have it here because that's the level of impact and, and so important. And, you know, more often than not, I get the question of, well, how is that even possible? You know, just last week, you know, Cecil asked the same question, almost like incredulous, like, how is this possible? Like, tell me. So we, of course, you know, here's how we did it. Um, but, you know, you think about, um, you know, first of all, security and the experience, right? We want to have the best user experience with the best security. Um, no one ever said a password was a great experience, ever, literally. Um, and so being passwordless is a huge user experience uplift. Um, but it's also a huge security uplift as well. Because one of the things we saw with traditional um, MFA tokens, you know, T you know, TOTP, is they can be intercepted and, and replayed in you know, very unique, very sophisticated circumstances that we saw ourselves firsthand. That was a, a day and a moment in my career where I will never forget it. It's like everything I thought I knew was actually wrong. And it was just shown to me why it was wrong. Unbelievable. It's really cool, right? To be clear, I appreciated it. But then the challenge became like, okay, well, how do we, you know, maneuver around this without completely, you know, upsetting everything? This is before FIDO was really a thing, by the way, right? Um, so enter certificates, right? The, the one means where it was decent browser support, SAML support, great user experience. Um, we could manage it at scale. And so that's the path we chose. And that's where we've been ever since. So passwords. Well, at the same time, we're asking ourselves, why are we joining anything to the domain, Active Directory domain? You know, um, I wrote an article earlier this year, uh, sort of tongue in cheek, you know, bit, uh, you know, whatever, provocative, I guess you could say, um, saying, you know, being joined to the domain is, is a perfect way to increase your attack surface um, and, and proliferate your, your credentials everywhere for attackers to, to come and grab, you know, every opportunity they have. Oh, so, sharing is sharing, yeah. Yeah, so you think about ransomware and you know how you get a ransomware event. Typically, it starts from the endpoint as a password, which then has access to the network, which uses domain credentials to get on the VPN. Right, all that happens all the time. Well, we don't have any of that, and so the pivots into our network are much more difficult as a result. And when we say networkless, right, what we really mean is everything is consumed through the internet. Right, we don't have to be on the network, quote unquote, to consume applications. And so it's a fantastic user experience we're all using now. Um, something that we've iterated towards since 2016, something like that, where the first conversations were like pie in the sky. Like, first of all, AirWatch doesn't manage anything but mobile phones. Um, everything we have is joined to the domain. How could we ever not do that? And this is nuts. Like, literally, like, we all thought it was nuts, but it's great when we'll start to happen. And so, you know, off we've been on this journey ever since, and we're still on the journey. We're, we're still iterating. We still have issues we want to solve and, and make better. So, so anyway, what do you so yeah, and I think you know that's something that's mind blowing to a lot of our customers that we speak to, and and certainly something you know we we've kind of as you said you know we've been on this journey for a while, so it seems normal to us. But the fact that you know our end user devices are are effectively a little isolated device all on its own, there's there's no implicit trust or very little implicit trust left in our end user environment, and that you know you're right that really does blow people's minds when we start. Talk to that. So I'm going to move on to our next slide. And so again, now you'll see this as part of the the more detailed story that we tell, um, and you'll see all the underpinnings, and we'll try and call them out that BZT has delivered to help deliver this. And a lot of our 
customers are very concerned about ransomware. So we talk a lot in here about how we mitigate or contain or you know divert ransomware attacks. Uh, hopefully that picture in the middle looks very familiar to everyone on here. Um, that's a fairly standard zero trust architecture diagram. This is the VMware version, <laughs> right? And you notice there in the middle is the apps and data, because that's really what Zero Trust talks about, is how do you protect your apps and data? And I think, Brad, one of the things we talk about is, you know, if the consumer of your applications and data is your users, then you need to protect your users just as much as you protect your apps and data, and ideally air gap them. And I think looking at the, the Zero Trust program, you know, a lot of what we've been doing is building that kind of air gap, um, you know, fundamentally, we were looking at insider risk back when this started. Insider risk translates into ransomware risk. Would you agree? Yeah, and you know the the, the design pattern, if you will, is to keep the data as far as possible from the endpoint and from from our colleagues, um, and then also make it accessible only through an API by the application that needs the data. You know, we look at OneDrive. We use that on our endpoints instead of network shares, like the traditional network shares. You know, NFS being uh, an exception, but a very well managed exception deep in the network, kind of a few people relatively. Um, but you know, every decision we made on the endpoint was about enabling it to function as an island, as you mentioned. Um, but with those sort of architectural disconnects, you know, if you compromise an endpoint and, and get a certificate or something like that, it's not useful in, in that context. Like it really is very difficult to use against us, right? Um, and so that's important because you know we have events and endpoints occasionally. You know the SOC sees these things, and we manage them. Um, but rarely do they spread beyond the endpoint itself. Rarely do we lose even lose much data, if if any at all. Um, and that's testament to the sort of multi layered program, right? It's not just one control that is responsible for everything. You know, it's the whole architecture enabling that control to be plug and play. Maybe it's Carbon Black today. Maybe it's CrowdStrike. Maybe it's Symantec. And maybe it's you know Simple One. Who knows, right? Doesn't matter as much because the architecture. Um, you know, in the endpoints, we use the, the native tools, native firewall for Mac and BitLocker for Windows to encrypt, native host-based firewalls, right, controlled by you know, Carbon Black, and all these things. Um, those are all intentional decisions for compatibility and to remove the impact on the endpoint and to keep the user experience as high as we possibly can. You know, whenever we have a bug in like Trellix or DLP agents or Carbon Black finds a binary that's a, a false positive, it creates genuine disruption to the business. So we do everything we can to mitigate that everywhere we possibly can, right? Um, and so few tools in the endpoint, a little footprint in the endpoint, but a very effective footprint as well, and a fantastic user experience. So it all comes together, right? And when I look back on what we've accomplished in partnership with another team, CET team, Dan Sanford, Dane Tadson, Alexander, JD, like all the folks here, Robert Coggins, all the folks over there have gone so far and above what they needed to do to deliver this. They own this more than we do, right? They're the ones who actually delivered on the vision that we have, right, together. And, and so that's, that's hugely important. So you said at the beginning of the meeting, our stakeholders did so much for us in this program. Absolutely. You know, and, and testament to that is the fact that they're now on the speaking circuit talking about, you know, they were all at VMware Explore. Uh, they've been at other conferences talking about how we've done these things. Um, because this is something to bear in mind. A lot of the customers we speak to uh, aren't anywhere near this. Right. Uh, we are well yeah. in advance of most organizations in terms of delivering on this vision. Yeah, I know a lot of them don't even know it's possible. Like you mentioned, like, how is this even possible? Um, you know, it's, a, it's a marketing problem, I guess, on our part. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. So let's have a look at um, network. So this is something we haven't really touched on yet. Um, obviously, we are a, an NSX customer. <laughs> um, and I know we had stuff in place with the NSX before Beyond Zero Trust came along, but if you think back to some of our very first initiatives were, you know, increasing the micro segmentation, increasing our east-west visibility. How does that translate, do you think, in reducing business risk in this day and age? Yeah, I mean, you know, lateral movement is difficult to detect and, and basically almost impossible to prevent. Um, and so micro segmentation can go a long way, you know, the, the more it's applied, of course, the better, as always. Um, but yeah, you know, like you said, here since 2018, every app has been required to be micro-segmented. Since I think 2019, roughly, maybe you use a BZ track, actually, um, there's also been a team full-time migrating uh, what we call brownfield applications to a micro-segmented uh, uh, environment. And so we're now in the many hundreds of applications that have been micro-segmented um, 
and by the networking team that did that, right? It was InfoSec was even you know involved in the day to day on that one, so that's fantastic. But it's all about the lateral movement, and uh, when you look at you know where most orgs are versus where we are, we're not far. We are far from perfect, right? We know that. We test ourselves. We know where the gaps are and how to solve them. Um, but you know, it, it it's all about moving the bar higher, incrementally higher every time. Now, we're never going to eliminate the possibilities, but if you can keep the bar higher and higher and higher, then that's the best strategy that's going to serve you well long term. As an example, Wi-Fi. When we all work remote, as you say here in that one weekend, right? Effectively, everyone. Um, the question came up was, well, we know that Wi-Fi at VMware is not great, um, you know, and we're all working from home anyhow. Well, what if when we came back to the office, whenever that day may be, we came back to an internet-only Wi-Fi? Okay, well, guess what? That's what we've done, right? VMware guest is internet-only. Still have an RFC 10 dot, you know, 10 dot address, right? But it's internet-only. And, and that's very much by design because it works just fine. If you need a VPN, you can certainly do that. And, and there, again, there's a partnership between us and the, and the networking team, John Sylvia, you know, one of the key players there. Uh, Pam Lee um, to to figure out how to do that in a very elegant, very efficient fashion, and they did it. So fantastic, right? We reduce risk in a huge way by doing that. Well, I think again, you know, that was one of the things we looked at. That, you know, if we step in beyond that zero trust concept of, you know, why do we implicitly trust officers? Because exactly. uh, we've got a security guard on the door. Implicit trust, right? It never helped anything. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. It was absolutely, you know, and. You know, and for those of you uh, who know, you know, we are currently working on doing exactly the same thing for the Ethernet network. Um, same same challenge, right? If someone walks into an office and plugs into an Ethernet jack, well, you've got two options in this world. You do network access control, uh, which is probably the worst technology in the world ever <laughs> from a management and, and supervision point of view, um, or you make that Ethernet network un untrusted. And that's what we're doing, exactly that same thing. You know, just let's let's create a level playing field uh, where anybody accessing our network has to come in uh, via a defined path. I think yeah. is just, just quickly going back to business impact and, and VPN access here. Um, for the longest time, in case folks weren't aware, there was a checkbox when you're, uh, as a manager, onboarding a new, a new hire. Um, and you could checkbox, do they need VPN access? And that's all that was required. Okay, at that point, where they get it? You know, token, all that good stuff. Um, but everyone was getting VPN, is my point, contractors included. So for yeah. a long time, and we had a situation where contractors could use their own device to connect to our network to do their work, and we didn't really have any control over what they're doing. So part of a BZ, you know, program, we said, you know, that's really not a good place to be. We've got a VDI environment already, you know, Horizon, you know, nothing else. And so we asked the business to, to change how they did business, and, and they did so. And you can no longer request VPN access through a checkbox. It's not a ticket for approval, um, but you can't get VDI. And VDI is using image almost identical to what we put on to a physical device and they're persistent as well. But here's the thing. At first, we had all kinds of problems. You know, connectivity issues, um, whether it's from the you know, contract to the VDI in you know, between kind of thing, or from the VDI into a network, uh, a customer. We didn't realize how much um, VPN we were doing into a customer environment to do work in their environment kind of thing. Um, so there's all these issues that we had to solve, right? And so Aju, you know, Suckerman, uh, came in every single time to help solve that definitively and, and make unhappy people happy, <laughs> happier at least, right? But most importantly, get their people functioning. Uh, but there is a great example of being a true partner to the business. If you have a business partner that's having an issue, we listen and we address immediately with urgency because they're addressing it urgently to make them whole, right? To make them better and get them back into being productive again. So there's another really difficult effort transition that we still have some issues we're still working through. But you know, it's 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 been successful no matter how you look at that. So yeah, absolutely. And I th I think the key thing to call out there as well is you know, there, there wasn't an option for the business to go back to the way it was. I, I think that's something our business had got very used to was if they made enough noise, we'd cave in and let them carry on doing it in the old fashioned way. And I think that was the big change, you know, and again, you know, kudos to the the comms team who, you know, I know Margaret put it in the chat. You know, they really did. They helped us articulate the why. Why was it important for us to not have contractors with VPN access to our network? I mean, most of us could kind of feel like, yeah, what, really? Of course you don't. But for our business, it made absolute sense, right? It was super easy. They deployed a, you know, the contractor downloaded an agent, uh, put the username and password in. And that was the worst bit is most of them were using passwords because they didn't have certificates. Um, and then they're straight on our network. Um, so yeah, it was it was a big effort and a lot of 
challenge, I think, um, came from certain areas of the business specifically that just wanted the easy button. And I think that was the real thing that uh, certainly Adjo and his team helped us was, was make the easy button VDI, not VPN. Indeed. But then consider all the um, help requests that the Oasis team had to, to shoulder, Mantish and his team, right? Oh, yes. The ripple from what we were doing is something I never truly appreciated, to be frank. Um, <laughs> Oasis channel, right? A lot of the questions still on Slack are, are related to something that happened in BZ. And um, they weren't prepared for that. And frankly, we didn't prepare them either. And so from a learning perspective, consider your stakeholders, the impact you're going to have on them as part of your core objectives for their projects. Because again, if, if you if we completely tipped over Oasis and they couldn't you know help anymore because they're too busy, well, we just messed up the whole project because now all the stakeholders trying to onboard BZ03 or whatever, maybe in this VPN thing here, whatever it may be, um, now everyone is in a bad place end to end. So what have you accomplished? You accomplished chaos, right? Which no one, of course, ever wants to do. Um, and so again, consider you know zooming out, look at the whole picture, almost like a like a map view of your world, you know, all your different stakeholders and what the impact could be or, or maybe super important to understand. And and I think, you know, just to pull on that a little bit more, you know, you think your standard IT change, uh, there's normally like a little box at the end of your IT change that says, have you informed the service desk? <laughs> and you just take the box. Yes, I told them it's coming. And I think this this was one where we really learned that value of having that that working relationship with that team to go, hey, this is coming. This is what it's going to look like. How do we make this as smooth as possible? I mean, you're right. The number of hypercare bridges that we ran, the number of enablement sessions that we did for the, the Oasis team, and how they stepped up, quite frankly. I mean, they really did step up uh, yeah. to help make this as smooth as possible for our users, which was amazing, really. So <clears throat> authentication, I think we've kind of talked about this, but one of the things that I always find uh, meaningful when we talk to people about this is how we ensure the integrity of an endpoint. Um, and again, this is something we've we've done and a lot of companies still struggle with. You know, We not only monitor patch levels and mandate patches for endpoint, but we actually take enforcement action if you're out of date. And I'm curious what you, you, know, you think is in terms of how we manage that application estate. What's different about that from this sort of zero trust point of view? You know, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to your last question, but commenting on the, the enforcement piece, right? I was actually impacted, and I think it's an area for opportunity as well. Um, I, I traveled so much, or one of my devices I didn't use, right? And it came back to you know, from, from the road and I'm using it, and it gets authenticated anything. I'm like, what the hell? This is so weird. And it's not giving me the, the pop-up for the certificate either, which I didn't I didn't connect mentally. I just didn't connect it. So I'm reaching out directly to my peers. I shouldn't be doing that, but it's, you know, that's what I do. I'm like, yeah, no, your endpoint hasn't been updated for like you know two months. I'm like, really? And so it turns out I've been unenrolled as we would expect, right? As it's supposed to do. Because and I did get all the emails. Of course, they're buried in my inbox, like you know, 2000 you know, messages deep kind of thing. Um but you know the info didn't tell me, hey, you're out of compliance, so you know off you go. Or maybe it did, but I missed it. It's kind of my point. And so anyway, long story short, patched the endpoint, got up to speed, and you know, 10, 15 minutes later, back to business, you know, as, as designed again. Um, and so you know that, that that's a really important point is you know we make all these changes, but without enforcement, you know, it's, it's theater, which you know I, I'm a fan of uh, outside of InfoSec. Then InfoSec I want things to be very much real, and so we've accomplished that, you know. And, uh, and and Chris Barnum has a question in the, in the webinar chat about SSO hurting these efforts and uh, uh, you know in, in any way, you know the, the answer is really more on the IDP side. You know, workspace one, we have concentrated risk in workspace one, um, and, and we recognize that. But you've got to be willing and able to do that for a program like this, whether it's workspace one as a federation mechanism up to your own IDP, whatever it may be. That's where your central risk is. You know, you look at how workspace one is architected for the enterprise. Awesome, uh, you know, all of our customers, right? Um, it's those again, those air gaps and API calls to make it as little as possible, reaching into wherever it needs to to make that authentication decision and moving you on as quickly as possible. So I don't think it's made things worse. It's just another risk we have to manage. But what I'd rather be managing than say Active Directory proliferation and passwords, right? The alternative is far, far worse, is kind of the point. I, I would build on that. I would say 
Christopher, certainly to start with, it, it was a challenge because we mandated SSO and for certain things that wasn't possible yet. Um, and so that was our challenge was we had to go and find ways to make SSO a reality for those kinds of technologies or platforms that maybe didn't support it yet. Uh, you know, a, a particular, we were all chuckling about this at VMware Explore. You know, those of you that, that had the privilege of going to Explore, you'd have noticed that the Explore website isn't SSO enabled. Right. Um, it's something every year we have the argument with the events team to say, hey, we can integrate this with our IDP. We could do this better. Um, so, you know, we th it's a constant struggle driving the SSO uh, for a lot of people. You know, they they still rely on, oh, well, actually, we'll just do it the good old fashioned way and educating them as to how easy SSO is. I think that's the real frustration. Once you know how to do it, it's really simple. Um, and super easy to manage and, you know, everything works. And, yeah, and yeah just getting, the, I think the more people that can uh, talk to the fact that SSO is an implementation as a technology that's really come of age and is possible and easy to do now, I think that would be certainly something to, to carry forth if you take a message out of this session. Please take that. <laughs> Um, this is something, Brad, uh, that we developed for explaining our end user estate. Um, and again, this this talks to the five areas of trust. And I think one of the, the things that I know both of us enjoy on this one is calling out certain key areas. So again, it's a very busy slide, but there's certain things, and I know we've talked about the AD domain list. That's always an important one. But the other one that's always important to customers is, you know, we're constantly looking at how to reduce our service count you know, how many suppliers do we use? How many services are we consuming? And how can we consolidate or make better? And I know this is something that you particularly went through at the start of your journey here at VMware. I don't know if you want to share some of the details on how we drove that kind of standardization. And Yeah. yeah. You know, when, I, when I started, yes, I started as a security, security architect um, and, uh, you know, for vCloud Air, for vCloud hybrid services at the time. And, um, you know, Alex joined and you know, we met and talking and you know just more and more responsibility, which was you know happy to do. And so one of the first things you know, we started working on together was managing the portfolio. And um, how we started is kind of fascinating. We started with finance. Where are we spending money? This is the cost center. There's only one cost center at the time for InfoSec. Where is the money being spent? There were vendors we'd never heard of, and we had we had to reach out to them like, so what are we buying from you? <laughs> this is bizarre, right? Um, but that's when we knew, okay, well, of course we have an issue, no surprise, um, but we also have an opportunity to, to streamline this thing. And so we started talking to, to Pat Gelsinger at the time and Sanjay to say, you know, this is important for us, but we think it's also important for our customer. So when we're talking to customers about security, let's talk about the importance of simplifying. Of course, hey, guess what? You can do that on VMware, you know, no coincidence. And, and so that became a whole um, sort of strategy thing, if you will, for us, but also by extension into the business to help communicate priorities to our customers and, and how they can do it as well. And so, you know, we whittled the portfolio, as I call it, down to single digits, but we kind of cheated because we bought a lot of what we liked, right? To be clear, we really did. Um, Carl Black being the, the most marque uh, version of that, uh, Last Line being another, as an example. Um, but the strategy was important. And we, you know, Chris Walden, you know, he's since moved on, very close partner of mine. Um, we always agreed to the concept of having a single pane of glass within the SOC to ensure the analysts had as few things to look at as possible to do their job. It's never that easy, but that's been the North Star and continues to be the North Star uh, ever since. Uh, because it's a, it's a great philosophy to have, right? You don't want to create sprawl in anything, especially a SOC. Almost like an athlete perspective. You know, some people can be biathletes, some people can be, you know, decathlon, but most are doing a single event, right? Because that's about all they can really be the best at. Well, you know, that translates into our minds as well, right? You, you don't want to be distracted during your day. You want to be focused on the risks you need to manage with as few tools as possible. So that's kind of where we ended up. But then customers ask us like, okay, so within your zero trust framework architecture, whatever you want to call it, what are you actually using? Right? We, let's talk about the, the what and the how and the why, but this is what in detail, right? This is a slide you normally would never lead with, but after you've had the conversation, these are all the components that go into our zero trust landscape. From endpoints to servers to, to cloud, everything in between, this is all the stuff we use right here. Which is a lot, but the vendor count is quite low, right? And so the complexity, relatively low. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, that, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, and our customers are always interested in that story. 
Um, you know, and I, I think it's testament to the fact that, you know, we've not only used our tools, as you said, but taken that stance of always testing. Why do we need this? What is it delivering? Could we do better with, with less? Because having the 100% tool isn't great if it's a completely different tool, whereas actually maybe you only need the 80%. And I think, you know, I, I'm going to come to Bernie's question. Uh, so Bernie asked us a question in the Q&A. And, and by the way, please put more questions in because we're going to go to a dedicated Q&A session in a moment. Um, but while we're on the topic, uh, Bernie asked, uh, if a third party were to assess VMware's security posture, where would we stand and what is the industry average? And in continuation to the above, where are we pre and post BZT? And yeah. I know, Brad, you know, we, we hit this yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So oh. let me first um, address kind of earliest days of, of the program, right? Shortly after Alex joined, one of the, the master strokes, you know, in my opinion, that he, he, he did was to have an independent assessment done of InfoSec at VMware as a baseline. Deloitte was the company that did that, right? And they've been with us ever since because earlier, every year, but since then biannually, you know, every two years, we compare ourselves to where we were. And we can show ourselves relative to our peers as well, both within uh, sort of SaaS services peers, but also enterprise peers, you know, more enterprising kind of companies, because it does differ. Um, but we're able to show that from the beginning all the way to current state and, and, and show the progress on very grand note, by the way. It's not just InfoSec, it's a blob, it's all kinds of stuff, including GRC and, you know, product security, you know, vSecker and scope and all those things. Um, and so it's been a fantastic way to show progress over time. Now, third-party testing, they're always going to find something. We find still stuff ourselves. You know, as we all know, we have a red team, and part of their job is to find it before someone else does, and it happens regularly, you know, nature of the beast, so to speak. Um, but, you know, how we manage that, how we architect ourselves to absorb and limit the blast radius, you know, all these things go in to a holistic program without too many single points of failure, right? And, and that's really the, the, the key part here is you're always going to have issues. There's no such thing as an infosic program with no issues. You're always going to have them. Um, how do you manage them? How do you sort of architecturally, you know, hopefully mitigate to a degree? Those are the things that are going to make you successful in, in, in your program. So, so yeah, so, you know, his final question, you know, where are we um, pre and post BZ journey? Well, we actually have a slide somewhere. Hopefully it's here. If not, I'm sure Eddie can find it, which summarizes exactly that, exactly where we started, you know, at the top end and where we are at that point in time last year, roughly, when we were in India, earlier this year, you know, that slide deck. Um, a fantastic view of here was the needle, here it is now, right in, in, in the right direction, of course. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't got that one, but we can certainly share it afterwards for those that are interested. Um, I wanted to add to that, you know, Brad, uh, remember CE Plus? Yes, Cyber yeah. Central Plus, it's a UK scheme. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's one of the big things that we've been challenged on, Bernie, is, you know, they had a, a requirement in the standard that all devices had to be AD joined. Um, and so we, we, you know, technically we would have failed the CE plus audit because our device is on. Um, and so we had to educate uh, that um, accrediting body as to why our way was better. And I know that's just one of the many examples. So I think, you know, when, when the industry looks at us, if they're using an established framework, and, and Brad, I know you've got thoughts on this too, you know, how much effort do we have to put in to educating these companies? Um, yeah, that actually, I'll, I'll start earlier than CE Plus because that came on a bit later. Um, earlier passwords, you know, why do we have to reset a password every 60 days? Right, let's make it 90. You know what, now let's go 180. Yeah, 180, okay, that's what we're going to do. And, and here's what we're going to do to ensure compensating controls. Um, Microsoft SSPR, secure password reset, right? Um, yep. Whoever goes through that, we're guaranteed that they have a good result for our standards, okay, fine. Can define the standards. Um, there's that, and then there's well, um, let's look at the passwords that are in place and make sure they're strong. Rather, the service account passwords, things like that. So we have multiple tracks to ensure improve the integrity of our password management program, and why 180 days was more than acceptable. We were on a path to saying, well, we should never have to reset a password unless there's a security incident that would would you know require that. Um, in fact, well, most of us don't use a password at all, so let's just make it garbage. You know, two to six random character, unless you want to need a password, in which case you can lease it, right? You know, for a temporary you know, period of time. Uh, case by case, of course, ticket based, you know, all that stuff. Um, but, you know, why this is important is we're so far ahead of the PCI DSS and many other regs as well. Auditors would always like, well, no, right? Of course, you're going to build this mark. Well, actually, here's what we're doing. 
And so, you know, it became a conversation until it became a deck and, you know, easier to, you know, to, uh, to discuss, you know, as to why we're better, you know, exceeding the standard and then you're accepted. But this is a lesson for all of us. There's the standard and then there's the arbiter making sure you meet the standard. Well, hey, you know, it's black and white, of course, right? But it's never so simple in business unless it can be, it really is. So in this case, it was the auditor's basically you know, assessment of, yep, I agree you're doing these things. I agree you're above the standard and I will advocate for you and call this a pass. Cool. So fast forward to C+. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I've spent personally more time on than anything else. And honestly, it was actually very enjoyable to do that. Um, you know, a lot of support from the team, but also a lot of support from, from the CE folks and IASME, the, the certification body as well. Because they agreed. Yeah, no, we, we never... Um, had in mind uh, an organization as large as VMware and not as you know, progressive as VMware. When these standards were written, it was more for the mom and pop shop. So they admitted it, okay, fine. But the problem is, you know, because it was in writing, they couldn't change it. Okay, so we had to do some things to sort of comply and, you know, whatever, right? We, ultimately, we achieved it and we still hold it in the certification. It's an annual thing. Um, but, you know, there's a great example of really, really having to educate to the point to where they were flying into Palo Alto. I was flying in to meet them in person to discuss doing a deck, like we did that a couple of times and they got it, they still get it, but it's not so simple for the regulatory body and certification body, you know, to just go make that change. And so, you know, to the overarching point we made before, we're here on the trajectory. Most other companies are, you know, almost visible down there, right? And that's the reality of what an organization body like that, a certification body like that has to uh, accommodate. For. So we're the 1% exception, right? Like in a good way versus the bad way. But that's <laughs> yeah. it's difficult and you know, equally as difficult to deal with, right? So, yeah. I, I think the, the point I was bringing out of that was, you know, the Beyond Zero Trust program has really helped us get better at articulating mitigation. You know, what are the compensating controls? What, what actually wraps around this? Not just the one control point. What are all of the control points? And then to the, the question we've got in Q&A, you know, where are exceptions acceptable and what is our risk tolerance? You know, I think we learned a lot about that as we went through the program. It's like, you know, stuff that we thought needed to be an exception, we found ways to make it work. Indeed, and exceptions by their nature are short term. Otherwise, it's a new way of doing business. So they've got to be short term. Um, and that was a whole lesson for me as well, is well, how do we manage these exceptions? The most easy being a firewall exception. I mean, we only need this port open, you know, to the internet, you know, from this environment for this period of time. All right, cool, we can get that. Well, hold on. You know, six months later, it was a three-month exception, still open. Well, crap, we didn't have a way to manage the exception process itself. Okay, well, we need to do that, right? Uh, and that's just a firewall exception, let alone the whole policy working group that Darcy and, and, and team are over and at the sort of corporate risk perspective, risk level, managing those exceptions to an outcome, by the way, not just a continual renewal of, right? You have to address it you know, holistically. And so, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge to say the least. And uh um, but, but, you know, every mature program, you know, it, it, within a, you know, a company like ours will have this process in place, um, to varying degrees of effectiveness, right. But they are important because that's the reality of, of, of what we're doing. We're managing risk, right. We can't just say no and, and, you know, um, cut the legs off of a project that's going to market and about to generate revenue. You know, AWS partnership is a great example of that. 2016, the decision we had to make at that point were very uncomfortable, but it was the right thing for the business. And the outcomes reflected those decisions as being positive because we did go back and address them, so good, good stuff. But we got to market quickly, right? We weren't uh, an impediment to getting the team launched. We helped them go faster with proper risk mitigation in place. So, absolutely. Yeah, there's one question that Warren has here in the, in the uh, chat, which is um, basically is Broadcom know about you know, Beyond Zero Trust? And, and the answer is they do. We covered it in July, uh, I'm sorry, January with them. We'll be covering it again in September with them as well. So very much aware and appreciative of what we've done. Cool. Um, so there's a couple of questions that um, got answered by the team, but I, I'm interested in your uh, thoughts on as well, Brad. Um, Jason was asking, communication was mentioned. Uh, what are the lessons did we learn out of this? Uh, how are the results of the projects affected by the execution of large cross-functional projects? You know, how, how did comms? Yeah, I think you know one of the ancillary lessons I learned is is um, um, comms is not trying to do our job, so we should not be trying to do their job, right? Because we need each other badly. So let them do their job. Give them what they need to communicate our message out. Of course, we ultimately own that message, but they are the professionals and they know how to, 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 to couch it properly. 
And so once we pulled back from the clubs and let them drive it, things got better pretty darn quickly, almost overnight, right? But that was a lesson for the team because we had so much ownership in this. We wanted to make sure all the way to the end, we did everything we could. That's great. But we have to recognize, you know, there comes a point where our partners need to take over on our behalf and make it work, right? And, and enable them to do that. So that was a super important lesson for me. Um, in terms of, you know, um, going forward, that framework is not going to leave. Like BZT at this point really doesn't need to exist as a brand, but it needs to exist as a project management framework because it works very well. Um, driving transformation at scale. That's what this thing is about. It's what we've done. And the lessons learned will be incorporated regularly. You know, Michelle, Mike Moreau, Eddie, like all the PNs, um, Jim, for that matter, like you know, Michelle, heck, everyone on this call, right, has, has incorporated those lessons and uh, every project has been better ever since. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just the key word I'm going to call out there was you said we need to enable the professionals to do their work. And I think that was that was the seesaw that we needed to balance was we were trying to do all the comms and that was getting in the way. And then we backed off a bit too far. And then the messages got confusing because they didn't necessarily have the, the detail that we needed. And then we found that that balance point of, right, so, you know, we need to tell them the stuff that needs to go out and then they make it shiny and understandable and they send the message. And well, and as technical folks, looking at this slide is a great example of how we think, right? Well, the world doesn't think like that. <laughs> sure as heck can't consume it. And so we send out like a five paragraph email with the thing of, you know, one line sentence at the bottom. And here's what you need to do. Yeah, not all that effective, right? Most people are not going to read all the way to the bottom if they even open it at all. <laughs> so you want to start with the why you're getting this email and what your action item is, and then the background if you're interested, you know? And so it's like the inverse of how we, you know, want to communicate as technical people. So, yeah, because I do the same thing. Like, you know, I'll, I'll write you a paragraph and say just a sentence if I can. So, <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I'm going to stop the share and we can move into questions if you like, Eddie. Yeah, the only other questions that came through were, um, are there any remaining security gaps that the program has not addressed? There are. We're continuing to address them, right? New tracks come in. We're, we're open to that. Um, so so yeah, the answer is yes, there are, and we are addressing them. And if you're aware of something, bring it up to anyone on this call. We will absolutely prioritize it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one is, how might AI play a role in implementing zero trust? So sure about the implementation, to be honest, and I've thought a lot about that. Um, AI absolutely has a role. There's no question, right? It's, it's already making you know all of our lives easier in many ways. You know, we'll continue to do so. Um, but in terms of you know, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the question again, kind of literal you know interpretation. Um, I don't know that there is a play yet. But keep in mind, ChatGPT just came into our world this year. I mean, you talk about disruptive and, and unpredictable as to what the outcomes are going to be. You know, I'm aware of a number of startups that are doing things that if they can make it happen, it's going to be freaking amazing, like really hugely beneficial. But the thing we have to keep in mind is, as people with jobs, um, like any major revolution, let's call it, or evolution, if you will, it creates more opportunity. You know, internet's a great example, right? It created huge opportunities in ways we didn't understand at the time and still don't understand fully what's next. AI is going to do the same thing as a co-pilot, as a force multiplier, not a force replacement. So, so it's, you know, again, as I've said, you know, particularly with this whole Broadcom thing, right, you know, optimists and the pessimists ultimately get to the same place, but one of them is going to have a much better time getting there. So see everything as an opportunity, and you're going to have a much better time in your career and probably be a bit more successful as well. So I think, I think we have time for just one more question. There's one from, uh, from Dustin. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go Greg. ahead, Craig. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, much like Brad's example of the, the internet, right, um, the internet created a divide. It created a divide of the people that could and understood and the people that couldn't and didn't. And bear in mind, AI is going to do the same. And I think it's up to us as professionals to try and help making that kind of technology as accessible as possible to as many as possible. So we don't leave a large tranche of people behind like we did when we did the, the whole internet boom thing. Right? Um, and I think, you know, think of AI as, as augmentation. How can it help you be better? Think of it as like a sidekick. Um, and I think that opens up a range of opportunities to deliver on on, the, on AI technologies. Sorry, Eddie, over to you. Oh, yeah, just one uh, last question from Dustin. Is there a goal based on the VDI notes that we will eventually move entirely to VDI only access in the future for remote work? I kind of doubt it, simply because we have so many different ways that people work. Um, 
if it makes sense, sure, right? But I think it's going to be very much a business leader decision um, as to whether it does make sense. So yeah, I think I don't think it's more complex than that. You know, it's a, it's an alternative. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at time. Uh, Craig and Brad, thank you so much for this really great discussion. Nice to hear your insights and comments on, on the program and so many elements of it. So thank you very much.